try to work around, like this is the main outline of my presentation, I'll work on the basics of what natural language processing is. Then I'll give the main pipeline of natural language processing and the main tasks. So it's kind of the main magic which happens like the data analytics and the machine learning. And then the summary of what I will be covering in the next 20, 25 minutes and the future, what lies ahead. So there was also a workshop on similar topics. It's kind of the same thing when it was with the organizer that there's also a workshop. So I kind of based on my yesterday experience, I classified the number of attendees based on these different categories. Like most of the people which I met yesterday were either undergraduate or graduate student, PhD students, and most of the people were in like industry. So either like a software team or a researcher team or a joint team, like where you share roles and like there are loads of other consult people and NLP enthusiasts and NLP admirers. So it's a kind of a so make vibrant kind of community. So can I have a, like a quick show of hands? Like how many people kind of they work with natural language processing or they know like bits and pieces of text processing and all? Like how many people know what is text processing, natural language processing and all? Yeah, a little bit higher so that, yeah, cool. And rest of the people like, I'll assume like you have a very, very basic or you don't understand the topic. I just wanted to know so that I can cover the basics in depth or like overview us depending on what the background is. So let's get started. So I guess the natural language processing is like it's the field which started in 1950s when like the computers were very, very at the beginning stage. And the main task was how we can make the computers understand what the natural language is. Like we all know this problem is kind of solved or like with the context we are able to handle. Like when we call bat, so depending on the context we can figure whether we can calling for a cricket bat or a flying bat. So this is like a common problem of word sense is ambiguation. But when we go beyond word level, when we look at sentence level, there is some ambiguity. So this is like a classic NLP 1.0 course example. Like I saw the man with telescope. So some of these complexity is inherently in the language itself. So depending on like where you put your comma, actually the sense will change. That I'm, I saw a man who was having a telescope or I have a telescope and with my telescope I saw a man. So there is this inherent complexity in the language itself. But let's don't go into the very basics. Let's look at the very common text. So it was just browsing through Quora. I guess some of you might be aware through Quora and there was this general question. I found it interesting like because it's kind of a Python. So yeah, it should be Python. So you can look, it's kind of a recent post. So is Python a dying language? And I'll just quickly like scan through the details. You can read it. A friend of my grandmother is a computer scientist from MIT. He told me that I should not learn Python because it's a dying language. Oh yes. And that I should learn assembly because it's better than Python. <laughs> and I'm not sure how many of you people have done algorithms and all, but there was one reply from Thomas Corman. And <laughs> those who know Thomas Corman, like, in our field in computer science and algorithms, like his book Introduction to Algorithm is like a Bible. And I'll just quickly scan through what his reply was so you can read. Oh yes, Python is absolutely in its death throes, which explains why your grandmother's friend Elva Meter is teaching it in 6.001, Introduction to Computer Science and Programming in Python. And why we teach it in CS1, Introduction to Programming and Computation at Dartmouth, because MIT and Dartmouth think it dreadfully important for all our students to learn dying languages. So yeah, it's kind of a funny laugh, but when I look back actually in the details of the comments and also you can see there is an edit by Corman. I, sorry, I won't go into the details, but it's kind of nice and funny in one sense, but I guess it makes you ponder, you know, you have to think when you are analyzing language. On one hand, it's funny, but on the one hand, depending on the people, depending on the culture and depending on thing, it's kind of too aggressive or it's kind of like, too much actually on the language part, or you can say it's kind of a bit negative actually. So there are so many things that are going into the language analysis because for this example, you can see, you know, like this is a common like a platform for sharing question answers. But when you look for like big people, you know, personalities and like public leaders and all, so they have to be very careful what they write and what are the meaning or what are the, you know, connotations of what they write. So the implications could be quite, quite hard. I'm not sure how many of you would be aware with this fact. There was like loads of stories which were back last year and recently, like for how much a tweet is sold. So there were some people who kind of sued some big other personality for defamation of the, for that other candidate. So like the single tweet cost that person about like million or billion of dollars. You can check back later on details or like I can give you more examples. So a single tweet can cost billion of dollars. So it's very much important. It's not just what you write 
but what are the different aspects? What are the sentiments? What are the notions? What are the semantics? So there are so many things which adds complexity. I guess we are getting serious, so let's take a funny example. So I guess this would be the common thing which all of us would be aware. So this is a conversation between a mom and his son. So mom says, your great aunt just passed away, lol. And the son said, why is that funny, mom? It's not funny, David, what do you mean? Mom, launched me lol means laughing out loud. Oh my goodness, I send that to everyone, I thought it means lots of love. I have to call everyone back, oh God. So I guess this is the common thing which we all could relate because this is happening with all of us. The language is changing with like social media and Twitter and like all those different things, the way we converse, the way we write, the way we kind of talk with every people we communicate is changing drastically. It's not like the software or the tools are bad, but the language inherently is changing. If you see like Oxford Dictionary, it's expanding and similarly is like the way we communicate and all. So there are these issues of data, sign, data sizes, which is like handling big data and like online stream. So this talk is not about handling big data and like how you handle those. So you have kind of infrastructure setups and like infrastructure like having clouds and like having clusters of nodes and like big GPUs and CPUs which can handle. So what we will be looking in this talk is why text processing is complex for machines. I guess with the above three examples which I showed you, you'll understand that there's lots of ambiguity in what we write. And the current tools and system are not able to understand the context which even sometimes it's hard for human beings. And the main important part is what we write. It's really hard to understand the user intentions or the purpose why we are writing. And then the systems are not able, like at this current stage or at this era, the system are not able to grasp much prior knowledge. And there are so many applications, so forget about like, so natural language is like a big, big thing and like there are so many applications you can look for, speech processing, information extraction, machine translation, question answering, summarization. Like we all interact with Google now, we have like Cortana, we have like amazing eco at our houses and there is like big war of eco Google Home. So we use kind of Google every time for information extraction and like we always interact with Google Voice queries. Machine translation is a big, big phenomenon, especially even with industries and even with the help of globalization and all, it becomes like an important field. So forget the application, but you can see there is a wide endless possibility of natural language processing. So after giving a brief overview of on natural language processing and what the complexity is, let's go into dive into the details. So what I understand or what I kind of comprehend based on my views is like all the development that happens in research is kind of like a building block. So you block, you make kind of different, different blocks. And in companies where there's a like a thing, where this, the main goal of is like, you know, look, looking at the production scale is you get assemble the blocks and you have a nice system. Or you have, might have a nice system and then you work as a research independent block and you put it in the main pipeline and get a, like a very well system. I guess the best example would be to see the self-driving cars. So the development of GPS and like other kind of technologies and your neural nets and image visualization and help these blocks help to make this kind of a nice technology of like the self-driving cars. So depending on which field or where you come from, industry, academia or like independent, I guess there are these different, different blocks or different, different tasks which kind of you can relate to or which are the tasks which you might be interested or working on sentiment analysis, time series analysis, change of topic, sarcasm detection. So we'll be looking at these blocks and then we'll now further go down the hill. So let's look at how we work on this block. So you can take this block, any of the block, and then we'll look into dive how we kind of work out the solution for that block. So the common NLP task, which I sh shared before, like the blocks kind of a thing, they go, they have a very basic kind of a similar structure. The first part is like preparing of data. Though it's like two step structure, but each steps can be kind of big, big problem. Like getting data and like processing your data can take a big step. And then it's like building models, kind of your classification or regression model. So there were some slides yesterday and even today which covered like the pipeline. So I would be just going in a brief, actually what is a typical pipeline, but depending on the problem, the pipeline might change. So, and as it says, like the complexity lies in the nitty gritty de details. And depending on the problem, you might want to spend more time or less time on each kind of these vertical parts. And with Python and with the Python softwares and all, each of the, in, like making the pipeline is kind of like a very easy problem. So let's look at, I have kind of had the last two main tags as a, like a big different blocks because 
depending on how intense you want to do text processing, so you might kind of skip the part of speech tagging and parsing, but let's look at some of these steps. So we know all the raw data which we get from different, let's say, servers or customers and all is kind of noisy. There are like loads of spelling mistakes and there are kind of encoding issues, especially when you have like UTF, ASCII, non-ASCII. So before you render your raw data into pipeline, you need to handle these kind of basic issues. And then it's like the tokenization. So normally when you have big documents, depending on whether it's a sentence level, you can go at the word level tokenization or sentence level tokenization. And even when we tokenize, tokenize is like we take a sentence and then chunk it or break it into pieces for analysis. But many times we go for the default like a white space tokenization, but it's, it's kind of like you have to see how to go about like handling your tokenization and especially like when you are using regex for kind of splitting your documents or splitting your text, what kind of punctuation handling you want to go. Because you can see there are some ambiguous cases like your name O'Neill, like, sorry, I'm not pronouncing it right or something. But do you want to consider like as a separate two word, like O separate, Neil separate, or combined word, or do you want to kind of have a underscore in between and combined have both, or like have both the representation. Similarly, like you have these acronyms and abbreviation like U dot S, so you want to kind of remove the dots where, and like when you have R in, so you want to have separate like R not or R in together. So these are like very basic, basic details actually, depending on the modules which you're working on, you can kind of modify the initial like the NLTK pipeline modules and then integrate into your systems and then like stock points removal. Like there are some stock words which are kind of general which are commonly used in Wikipedia and like you can find loads of, but I'll show you later also and like it's always better have a, like a standard uh, stock word list but depending on what is the domain you are working, let's say if you're working with health, finance, clinical or different domains, so it's necessary to have an in-domain stock word list and use that. Just to work on, like there is an example. So I was working on a data which was kind of a physics forum for students. So you can see, if I have on and off as my stop word, then both of these sentences would remain same, but they are entirely different. Like a bulb is switched on, bulb is switched off. So on and off, so it's, they might sound kind of stop words, but depending on your domain or what area you're working with, you have to kind of tune your stop words. And then it's kind of this, typical like a stamming which everybody performs depending on your applications. You have computer, computing, computation. So you kind of remove the suffix and get back to the same words. And I have a small sample from NLTK. So main thing is like with Python toolkits and especially with NLTK, like all this processing, like getting your basic pipeline, it's simple. Like you can write a small function which has these four lines and it does the stamming for you. And then depending on whether you want to do go into intense kind of natural language processing. So this is a very basic example. It's kind of same like your NLP 1.0. It's like, it's a great book or book my ticket. So you can see the behavior of book is different. It's a noun in one place and it's kind of verb in different place. So these kind of natural language, like your part of speech, whether what's the kind of the knowledge, what's the word is about, is kind of very handy actually when you do into deeper analysis of your text. and depending on whether if you're interested in seeing how the words connect with each other and how they relate, you can go into like parsing. So just to mention, so we initially tried the NLTK toolkit, but we kind of couldn't configure that to like import the Stanford packages. So finally we used the Stanford parser because the performance was quite better in that. But main thing is with parsing, you can see how the words which are across your sentences or across different parts of your documents, they kind of relate. So you can find the relationship and use these kind of your further processing kind of a thing. So now as I was earlier telling you about like the two main step is preparing your data. So we have seen like we kind of went through a text processing and then we like prepared our data with the pipeline. And then the next main task is like building model and classification regression. So I would like recently this was like my friend introduced to me this phenomenon of dunk, duck punch phenomenon. You can check back later when you go back to the internet. So it's commonly used for jQuery and JavaScript kind of a thing. But main thing is like it's like if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So if this duck is not giving you the noise that you want, you have got to just punch that duck until it returns what you expect. Some of the, you might be thinking how in the world it's relevant to that. So let me put into back into this perspective. So we data scientists or research scientists have this very nice habit of giving us whatever the problem is, we try to you know, comprehend the problem get it to a point and then generalize it as a, either as a classification or let's say a regression or a prediction model. So whatever the, let's say, predicting the, like how many ages or like what kind of clothes or what kind of a colors people are like 
interested in buying clothes or different kind of different problem. So it's like we try to restrict and like break every problem, every duck and punch it back until we further break it down as a classification or regression problem. And then we, we can learn on modelings. So this was the whole kind of a brief of NLP task and blocks. So now I'll walk through like that because of the time constraint, I won't be going into details, but a two block or like a two tasks that we kind of work on benchmark tasks. So one is I will, which I'll be talking in detail is the semantic textual similarity prediction. And the other thing is the question classification in which especially I will be talking about similar question detection. So this is a task, this is hosted by Semivel. I guess some of you might be aware. It's kind of a benchmark competition which where the task is given a two pair of sentences. You have to predict like how similar those sentences are. So you can see it's not like just predicting what these sentences, what the words are, but what is the semantics? So you can see, you know, like in sentence one and two, like you know you are right, well you are half right. You know they are making some sense or they're talking about something, but what is the semantic meaning? Or let's say you talk about next example. FAA is like Federation of Aeroplane or Aviation or something, continuous ban on US flights to Tel Aviv. FAA lifts ban on US flights to Tel Aviv. So you have to understand the nature of the task. It's like you're trying to predict what is the, se like the semantics. What is the meaning actually behind this sentences? And you can kind of find a similarity like application to different things. It's, it's a common problem when we search on Google just to kind of relate. Many times we kind of figure out, you know, why the Google is not understanding apart from like a keyword query when we try. It's really hard to tell what we want and what the system understands. So it's like getting the semantics correct. So in this task, so we were given a two pair of sentences and we have to come up with a score. So it's kind of a regression problem in which, so a score of zero indicates that there is no similarity between the text pairs and a score of five indicates that it's exactly similar. And they have like a fixed kind of a notion guidelines actually when it will be one, two, three, and four. Sorry, just a second. So just to keep in track, I guess many of the people are aware and like it has been thanks to the previous speaker and other talks actually. So we work, this topics were covered in detail. So what is this task is kind of a regression problem in which we have to predict a real value for this text pair. And just to keep on line, so this is like a traditional R2 kind of problems in machine learning. It's like a classification when you have real categories or when you have your real regression problem when you have to predict a value. So for this task, our emphasis was on regression. So I'll just quickly walk, so it's like we had our data prepared as I walk through the data pipeline. So next was a feature extraction part. So the first, so I'll walk through some of the features that we had in the system submission that we had. So one was a cosine similarity. I, uh, this figure won't do justice because currently it has documents or it's my fault I should choose a better figure. but. You can understand that each document is kind of a one sentence. And then like, so it's kind of in cosine similarity is kind of you have your vector representation. So you have like words and like in your sentence one, let's say these are the words in sentence two, these are the words, but forget about rest of the document. So it's like D1 and D2 and you want to see how similar these two sentences or you, your documents which have sentences are. And then you do a normal cosine similarity. So you're like cosine similarity of Kung Fu Panda and Tigress. So it's kind of similarly your cos theta, which is like a, b, and mod of a, and mod of b. But as I told you before, so this is kind of a semantics task. And you can see, like, if you look at sentence one and two, and if I just look at the cosine similarity, which is your overlap of words, then sentence one and sentence two will get, like, almost four or even more than four because all the words apart from continues and lifts match. So it's like FAA ban on US flights. But you can see it's entirely opposite. So you know there is a big flaw with the normal cosine similarity because you're just looking at hard words. You're not looking beyond the typical words, looking at the semantics of the word. So we all know like a boom which came in 2012 and 13, especially my researcher friends can kind of relate. So like all the word to work embeddings and all thanks to Thomas McLove and all the people who was working. So it's like trying to learn more from the context actually and trying to find similar words. So looking into the semantics. So it's kind of same. So it's like you have a big, big corpus and from the corpus you try to learn. It's kind of not exactly we can call it as like co-occurrence co or like LSA models or something, but it's on like similar notion because you are learning the distribution semantics. So you say when I am talking about general, let's say man, man do this, man does that. Then in the same notion, I can say like I use the same context actually or like the same kind of typical notion when I describe women or when I talk about women. 
So it's kind of same when I'm talking about like king, king, king does that, king lives in a castle, king does that. So I can similarly, like in the context, I'll be using similar kind of my vocabulary. So that's why using the same corpus, which is talking about similar entities, you kind of project that into a big dimension and then you try to find similarity. So the main thing is to understand is, it looks beyond the word typical nature. So it just looks beyond the word, it looks at the semantics. So what is the context in which the word is using? So that's kind of very handy because then you can say when you compare your different words, so you can know that both the words are kind of quite opposite. And the other thing, when you kind of project this, your big data into some kind of dimensional space, you also get similarities between different words and different kind of as part of speech information, let's say walking, walks, swam, swimming. So you kind of, some of the patterns which you see, which you'll understand in language, like the tense and like the verb forms and all similarly are captured when you project your data into like a big dimension space and all. And it's kind of same, another example, so you capture, so the main thing is that you capture loads of similarities which normal are kind of quite generic to a human being, but which has been made feasible through the use of word to vec So you, we use like word to vec features and cosine features. And the best thing is that the features which you get through word to vec like for a word, let's say, king. So for a king, let's say, depending on your dimension, what you said at 200, it will be a real feature, actually. So it makes the algebraic computation or manipulation easy, like you can just add two words or you can subtract two words. And those are meaningful compositions actually when you kind of add or subtract those words. So we had about 50 features which were like cosine similarity, word to x similarity, and then we kind of did some kind of algebraic manipulation. It's like when you have these information for a sentence is how you compare these two sentences. So now you know the word meanings, but how you compare the information. And then when we say that these sentences are similar, then at least these sentences should be talking about similar nouns or they should be talking about similar verbs. So we kind of manifested these features and then we had some kind of parse features in our model. And then we took also some kind of machine like machine translation alignment features and like some features from another system which was Stake Lab. And thanks to the previous speakers, so it's kind of the main thing like the gradient boost algorithm was covered. So we kind of used the same kind of for a regression model. And so these were some of the results actually that we got. And the main thing was like we see like when you kind of manipulate the context actually in your, to your notion, then it's kind of improves your performance quite significantly. And another thing that we learned in this task was in-domain training data and adaptation is really, really helpful. And as the time is less, so I'll try to just show this. So this was just to give a background. So this was another problem which we were working on question classification in which the task was. So we were working with the stack overflow data set in which given a question, a task was to predict similar questions. The main thing I just wanted to show is that, so the typical mechanism is like, either you do a cosine similarity or you use an information retrieval model. Like my background is more information retrieval, so you do a kind of a search model, you kind of query and find similar questions, normal through retrieval model. But I guess as you might have seen in like other problems, like other previous talks and all, the problem when you're handling like big, big data, because this was like million of questions, it's like your data gets so big and your metrics get very, very sparse. And it's really a big problem and challenge. So we also tried like, as we did word to work where we were embedding the words. So thanks to same the people, those who work actually, that was like another paper which came in 2014 and it changed some of the things, it's like doc to work So it's like, if we can model the words in higher dimension, we can similarly model documents or like sentences or paragraphs kind of a thing and like get a combined representation for those questions so that a context is kind of finite. So the main conclusion that we learned actually from these tasks is like handling context becomes better when you are handling like these kind of word to vec or doc to vec vectors and it addresses the issue of word sense disambiguation and your data gets reduced to low dimensions. So earlier when you were having thousands of dimensions because your metrics was like the document and term metrics was getting so huge. So now you can reduce your whole data into 200 or 500 dimensions and even you can perform easily like the algebraic manipulations and the weighted over different kind of your vectors. And it gives a better boost actually because it's kind of context, it's capturing more context over the textual features. So just to provide a summary, so we looked into the NLP in general and why natural language processing is hard or complex. We walked through a basic, like a text processing pipeline of natural language processing and I tried to cover like a bit of semantic textual similarity and similar question detection tasks. And these are some of the tools that we 
use handily actually for some of these tasks and like they are really really like a savior what lies next so what is the biggest challenge and like the main thing i will like so this is kind of another which i uh, uh, from imagenet competition actually is like so it's like image caption generation is becoming really really a big big nice like achievable task because so the systems are getting much better and they're doing a great job as like compared to the human performance but in some of the cases they don't do well the main thing is not like they're not doing well what i would like to project is what i was talking earlier is the building blocks that we had earlier so the speed with the help of deep learning the building blocks are accelerating is quietly like challenging and shocking so thanks these are the references and uh, thanks a lot to python island and python organizers and it's kind of a sale pitch but if 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 somebody is looking for like a machine learning and nlp enthusiast so i'll be like from next year or something then i'd like to talk if you are interested more on machine learning and nlp and like some of the projects i'm working on